Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. So today I'll be talking about the Public Health Disparities Geocoding Project 2.0, which um, was a training with uh, about 150 people from all over academia, the public sector, nonprofits, um, public health departments, and also private industry as well. So before I get into really the nitty gritty of what we did, I wanna acknowledge our team. Our team was really miraculous and wonderful in putting all of this together. Nancy Krieger uh, at the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health was the PI for the population, uh, sorry, Public Health Disparities Geocoding Project 1.0, which Alessandra mentioned was done back in around 2004. But we also have Professor Jarvis Chen, Pamela Waterman, myself, Anjali Hall, Dana Javadi, um, uh, Justin Morgan, Tamara Rushevich, and Shu Saha, who all contributed their wonderful expertise across a range of uh, focus areas, including urban planning, political and economic determinants of health, community-engaged research, social epidemiology, and statistical modeling expertise. For the next little bit, I'd really like to talk about the background to the project. And so how we ended up deciding to do this project and what were some of the ideas that were precursor to it. So the main idea was that our training taught people why and how to analyze population health and health inequities in relation to census tract, county, and other georeferenced societal and env environmental data. These trainings were conducted over two four-day workshops offered in June and July of 2022. We invited 75 workshop attendants for each of those sessions from the diverse backgrounds that I just mentioned, including uh, folks from the CDC, uh, policy think tanks, advocacy groups, and of course, researchers, professors, students, and staff from academia. And um, before I go further, I wanna emphasize that these workshops were offered completely free of cost and they were funded through the American Cancer Society Clinical Research Professorship Award to Nancy Krieger. So a uh, little piece was written in the Harvard School of Public Health News, and I thought that this poll quote really summarized quite well what we accomplished and what we did, what our aims were. And it's Nancy Krieger saying that a core function of public health is to monitor inequities and to see if they are getting worse, staying stagnant, or getting better. If you don't have the metrics to do that easily, you can't see it. So that's really what this was about, was showing people how to monitor health inequities so that we can see whether those metrics are changing, and if so, how. I want to talk a little bit about the original Population Health Disparities Geocoding Project, which you'll see abbreviated PHDGP a few times through this talk. And uh, that project aimed to discuss and publish research on what level of geography was best to analyze health disparities. And um, the techniques involved in these projects have come a long way, mostly, well, largely in part due to the work of Nancy Krieger, but also due to the maturation of statistical techniques and geographic information systems and software um, done elsewhere. Nancy Krieger started this work looking especially at cancer registry data. And her unique insight was that we could tie people's records, their health records, in, in this case, cancer registry data, to their residential address. The idea being that residential address is a field commonly located in databases, and that's something underutilized. Once we tie in uh, area-based social metrics, which I'll introduce in a bit, to uh, participants health records based on their residential address, we can learn a lot more about health inequities, how health inequities are distributed geographically. The first incarnation of the population, the public health geocoding, sorry, public health disparities geocoding project, and not just to inform public health practitioners about how to go about their work assessing, documenting, and combating health inequities, but to also ask the question at what geographic level and using what social variables are health disparities best understood? That work culminated in the recommendation that the census tract level was best to focus on and to use an area-based social metric of what proportion of households were under the federal poverty line as defined by cut points ranging from zero to 5% of households, five to 10%, 10 to 20% and 20% and above. And just as a reminder, that work was done back in the early 2000s. 
the origins of these ideas, the idea of linking people's play, health to the place that they live is not new. It's old, in fact, and there were precursors to the work that Nancy Krieger did. I particularly want to highlight some of the work by Louis René Verme in the 1840s, and he was one of the first people to do this kind of work. He uh, studied the living and working conditions of factory workers in various industries, and he found that poor and poor living and working conditions were directly correlated with higher mortality rates in areas of Paris. This was, of course, contrary to the prevalent theories at the time, which included theories of disease distribution, such as miasma theory, or literally bad air, or moral failures and behavior of the poor, and also things like divine punishment. So this was actually revolutionary at the time to think about how people's geography, how the places that they lived affected their health. And of course, a long history since then has developed into things like the American census and other censuses, which allow us to carry out this kind of work. I wanna talk a little bit about health equity, which is one of the central goals of public health. And health equity refers to conditions in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Unfortunately, we live in a world today where there are inequities that are unfair, unjust, and preventable. These inequitable conditions have been created by a long history of discrimination and marginalization. Highlighted here are the detectable effects of Jim Crow laws, in this case on infant mortality, and also historical redlining, which worked to keep people of color from housing in more white and affluent neighborhoods across the United States and served to concentrate poverty and people of color in areas that were given lower grades as a result of their proximity to industrial sources of pollution less than ideal living conditions and other characteristics that were perceived as undesirable. I also want to talk about health justice. A similar but distinct concept to health equity is the concept of health justice. Health justice is an approach to public health that seeks to eliminate health disparities and achieve health equity by dismantling systems of discrimination, oppression, and marginalization that contribute to poor health outcomes. Health justice emphasizes the importance of addressing the root causes of health inequities and redistributing power away from unjust systems to ensure that all individuals and communities have access to the resources, opportunities, and conditions necessary to achieve optimal health and well being. I want to describe what's on the slide for you, which is a Google Trends plot of health equity versus health justice. And you can note that health equity is experiencing something of a heyday. It's become quite popular to talk about health equity. Meanwhile, health justice has somewhat lagged behind. Health equity, uh, excuse me, health justice means challenging and dismantling institutional and structural barriers that perpetuate health disparities, including racism, gender, and sexuality-based discrimination, ableism, weight stigma, ageism, and others. So I particularly want to emphasize that while health equity has become a bit popular, health justice has lagged behind. And I think we need to talk about why health equity is so much more popular than health justice. And we need to refocus on the actual mechanisms by which we create health equity, including redistributing power and resources. That leads me to introduce Nancy Krieger's theory eco-social theory, which is a framework for understanding health disparities that Nancy Krieger has been developing for the past several decades. Eco-social theory specifically asks us to identify how individuals physically and biologically embody the harms, disadvantages, and injustices done unto them by systems of oppression that exist as a result of contemporary political economy across the life course and across levels of society. Moreover, this framework calls into focus that the accountability of systems of power and individuals' agency within them are foundational causal factors in the explanation of the inequitable distribution of disease. So with that bit of background covered, I'd like to talk about the methods and the techniques that we introduced, as well as some particular methodological considerations that we taught in our trainings. The first of which is foundational. It's in the name, geocoding. So what is it? It refers to the process by which we go from address records to latitude longitude point locations, and then thereby link those to areas. So oftentimes we have addresses in databases. This is one of the things that's routinely corrected, collected. And it's an incredibly powerful technique because in health systems, 
data entry is often a pain point. Doctors often complain about how entering data into the electronic med medical record means that that's times that they're spending typing, looking at the computer instead of literally seeing their patients eye to eye. Taking advantage of the fact that addresses, residential addresses in particular, are so often routinely collected, we can use services like Google Maps, ArcGIS, and the Census Geocoder, among others, to convert those addresses into latitude and longitude locations that can then be easily linked to geographic entities, such as census tracts, counties, zip codes, etc. Once we've linked those addresses to geographic entities, we can tie them then to area-based social metrics. What used to be called area-based socioeconomic metrics, and is still called that by many, we call area-based social metrics to bring in the focus on the social dimension of the work. Area-based social metrics are quantitative measures that capture and represent the social, economic, and demographic characteristics of a specific geographic area or community. Some common ABSMs, which is how we'll abbreviate this, include socioeconomic status, such as income, education, employment, poverty, and racialized economic segregation, which I'll describe a bit more in a moment. They also include demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, and racial ethnic breakdowns. They include things like housing and living conditions, access to healthcare services, including the density of healthcare facilities, and insurance coverage. Moreover, they include environmental factors like air and water quality, access to green spaces, and environmental hazards. What I really want to emphasize is that these are measures collected at the area level, and we can tie them to the places where people actually live and reside. On the slide are some examples shown from the CDC or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Social Vulnerability Index, which is designed to help public health officials and local planners better prepare for and respond to emergency events like hurricanes, pandemics, exposure to dangerous chemicals, et cetera. And you'll see that those examples from the CDC SVI or Social Vulnerability Index include things like socioeconomic status, household characteristics, racial and ethnic minority status, and housing type and transportation availability. One particular ABSM that we use frequently because it's highly effective at uh, allowing us to understand and measure health disparities is the index of concentration at the extremes. The index of concentration at the extremes is a measure of the extent to which a population in the specified area is concentrated into the best off and worst off extremes of a specified social distribution. The index of concentration ex at the extremes was introduced into the sociological literature by a uh, scholar Massey in 2001 to measure economic polarization, he was particularly interested in uh, social stratification and came up with this measure to study that further. Building on that work, Nancy Krieger and others developed two novel ICE measures, which is how we we'll abbreviate index of concentration at the extremes, for one for racialized segregation and one for racialized economic segregation. To zoom in a little bit, if I can, yeah. The formula is fairly straightforward and simple. In its most generalized form, we're talking about the number in the most privileged group minus the number in the least privileged group over the total population. So to describe the range that this can take on, if it's one, that's saying that the area is concentrated full of very, very highly privileged people. And if it's negative one, that's saying that the area is full of people who are marginalized or in the least privileged group. Uh, if we think about some specific examples using data from routinely collected census measures, we can talk about racialized economic segregation, here defined as the number of white non-Hispanic people living in high income households, those earning more than 100,000 annually, versus number of pe people of color in low earning households less than $25,000 annually divided by the total population. So in this specific instance, we're talking about privilege being a high concentration of white affluent people versus a high concentration of poor uh, low income people. And it's important that we're talking about, we're capturing both of these dimensions, race and economics at the same time, as opposed to separately. So I want you to do a little bit of a mental 
uh, experiment, I want you to think about what the ICE for racialized economic segregation might look like in the US at different geographic levels, namely the county, congressional district, and state levels. Just think about for a second how you expect that to be distributed, what you think that might look like. If you're ready, we can go on. So here's the map at the county level. And there's a few things that I want to point out. I particularly want to focus on the distribution of where people of color living in poor households are located. So uh, first off, I want to note that this is Puerto Rico, one of the US territories included here. And we have this strip running through the south that I'd like to particularly point out. This is predominated by often Black households living as I described in uh, households earning less than $25,000 a year. We also have some are areas of New Mexico and Arizona where there's a predominance of people of color living in low income households. And we also have areas of Alaska, which may include Alaska native people living in uh, essentially poverty conditions. Now, if we compare that to something like congressional districts, which are drawn with political motivations in mind, I want you to notice what disappears when we shift to that perspective. Excuse me. There's still some visible uh, locations where we see a predominance of people of color living in poor households. But for the most part, we see less areas where they are visible and some areas where they're rendered completely invisible, like in Alaska and in Arizona and New Mexico. And then, of course, if we aggregate all the way up to the state level, the picture becomes even less visible for those folks. So again, just to flip through, I want you to see just how this process of aggregating and changing the boundaries that are used can render some populations invisible or visible. There are a lot of US geographies to choose from. I just gave you three examples that were census tracts. Uh, congressional districts and the state level. One uh, popular area boundary that is used are zip codes or zip code tabulation areas. I just want to highlight for you how far off. This is called the census spine. This is what's used for a lot of geographic studies and understanding uh, geography and demography in the United States quite frequently. Zip code tabulations are quite far off of the spine. They're not made up of things like census tracts, and they don't mesh well with county boundaries uh, because their origins is in postal service. And so they have a different purpose that they were originally designed for. They are frequently used in analyses of health disparities because they're convenient. They're often just a record you can pull out directly from the address, but they're not as evenly distributed as something like census tracts, which are designed to be more evenly distributed. And then I do want to point out that counties are quite unevenly distributed in their population. We have some counties like Orange County in California that has something like 13 million people in it. And we have lots of counties that are much, much smaller in that, than that in the hundreds and low thousands. So the choice of what boundaries to use presents an interesting problem for geographers and people studying health inequities and health disparities. And I wanna note that this comes in two flavors, essentially. There's the modifiable aerial unit problem, where when we change the boundaries that are drawn, we can essentially change what is shown on the map by literally centering or marginalizing people's experiences. And then I also wanna talk about what the ecologic fallacy is because the ecologic fallacy is a problem that often comes up around deduction and inference that's made once mapped results are presented. One of the issues as visualized on the right-hand side is that once we are able to look at a lower geographic level, we may find that the same correlations that we see at a higher level don't hold. So an easy to understand example of this is one, one example is that we see a pattern in the US that higher income states tend to vote more democratically. But at the same time, if we zoom in and look at the individual level within states, higher income individuals, there are many states where higher income individuals are more likely to vote conservatively. So this is an example where the correlation we see at the state level doesn't hold when we zoom into the individual level. This is a particular consideration that you need to be very careful of when doing geographic studies. 
And so it's something that we taught in our training because it's just really important to get right and to not uh, misstate something as uh, being validly downscaled to another level of geography. And so just to make it crystal clear, to relate this to the figure, the animation shown on the right-hand side here, um, this would be like saying, what if for each of those strata in each of those colors, we collapsed the observations. You could imagine that those are different observations from different states, and we took a state level average. Well, if we look at the trend line in the state level average, that would be decreasing in the X and Y relationship. Meanwhile, if we can look at the observations at the individual level within states, we see that we get the increasing relationship shown by the multiple trend lines for each of the strata. I want to talk about a bit now about how we would actually get area-based social metrics. I did introduce earlier the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, which is a nice platform from which we can just download some area-based social metrics, but often we want to construct some of our own, and we want them at a pretty high resolution. One of the most useful resources for area-based social metrics in the United States is the census and the census products. The census has a few different products, including the decennial census, which is probably the one that most people are the most familiar with, but they also have the American Community Survey, which is done every year, collects data, and are provided in uh, five-year pooled estimates. And so what we can do is we can get data using R and using the tidy census package with code that is pretty straightforward, I, I think, uh, to request data at the tract level, the census tract level for the geography. We do have to go through a data dictionary to find what variables we want. In this case, we want this B1901301 variable for median income. There is just a data page that you can look at on the census to find these variables. We can tell the tidy census syntax that we want the data for the New York State, for New York County, for the 2020 uh, five-year ACS, and then we want to get geometry data, i.e. E, uh, a shape file, a, a GIS type shape file with our data. And then with some simple plotting code in R, we can also plot that data. So this is an example for essentially Manhattan. And you can see some uh, features that I think are worth pointing out. So it here in gray is Central Park. This is just gray because it's uh, not applicable data. There isn't a median income for that. You can see the really desirable kind of housing right next to that on the upper uh, east side where we see really high income high median income close to 250,000. There are, of course, other areas with high income. And there's also areas like Harlem and the Washington Heights where we see much, much lower income. So this could be an area-based social metric that we could incorporate into our health disparities research. I want to describe a little bit about why we should use code to generate these area-based social metrics and to map them. Um, when I introduce tidy census, I find that there's kind of three popular reactions. One is, wow, I can't wait to start getting using this. Another is, why should I bother doing this in code when I can already do it in GIS? And another is, I'm a little bit overwhelmed and not sure where to start. So I'd like to address each of these. Um, there are some caveats to mapping and uh, uh, particularly around taking into account age effects and statistical noise that I'm going to be talking about. So for those super eager, I encourage you to keep paying attention. For those who are asking what's better about using something like tidy census versus the more traditional GIS approach, I think the answer really lies in reproducibility. So this figure from Gerard and Limber Lambert uh, emphasizes that if you only have the map, that's kind of not really reproducible. Meanwhile, on the other other end of the spectrum, if you have a map and the linked uh, code and data that was used to create that map, that's highly reproducible. And communities can more readily engage with that to ask if the research is being done in a way that reflects their knowledge, their understanding, and uh, to make sure that the methods are being used appropriately. 
One of the things I want to talk about is age standardization. So I said that there's some caveats. When you make a map, you can't just immediately run into interpreting it for looking at areas with the worst health outcomes and saying, OK, well, that's the place where we need to intervene. Sometimes that effect is just due to age effects. So that should be something very understandable for people living in the Boston area. Um, I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see this a little bit more clearly. This is a map of uh, census tracts in Suffolk County, so Boston proper, and uh, median age is shown in color. And then in the inset bar graph is the age distribution of this census tract. This census tract is where the BU a uh, Questrom School of Business is located. And so you can see that there's a huge predominant predominance of people in the 15 to 24 age range. And the median age there is something just over 20. And so if we were to look at something like COVID-19 mortality rates, a disease which predominantly and largely affects, well, what I'll actually, let me rephrase, age, especially age over 65 is one of the single greatest largest risk factors for COVID-19 mortality, if we were to look at something like COVID-19 mortality by census tract in Boston, we wouldn't expect to see very much COVID-19 mortality in a census tract like this. And it's not to say, wow, they're doing really, really great in the census tract. It's just a function of their age distribution. So we really need to be careful when we present uh, results of health outcomes, health rates at the census tract level and at, across any kind of geography. So what can we do? Well, we use a process called age standardization in epidemiology. This is a standard data that is available from the NIH Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program. And I wanna focus just on these first two columns. So this is what's referred to as the US standard population. And it has for each age strata, these are roughly five-year age bands. Uh, it has something called the U.S. standard million for the year 2000, and this is basically a age breakdown. What if we had a million people that were broken down into age buckets just as the age distribution of the U.S. was at large? And so we can use this as a reference population and reweight our health outcomes to say, what if our health outcomes were from a population that had that age distribution? And that uh, allows us to create maps that are more comparable. So here's an example in the Boston area. This is just looking at an area-based social metric first. So this is census tract percent below poverty uh, for those different cut points that I described before. And in red, we have the uh, group of census tracts that are in the 20 to 100% of households living under the poverty line. And so a natural health disparities question would be, what is something like the premature mortality rate, the mortality rate of those under age 65 in those census tracts versus the most well-off census tracts? And we should adjust for age because there might be systematic variation or correlation between poverty and age at the census tract level. So we wanna take that into account. We could just sum up the number of deaths we observe in each of these categories of census tracts, the lowest and the highest poverty uh, census tract, and that would give you this 627 number and this 3,574 number, but uh, we wouldn't yet have our age standardized rate. So how would we get our age standardized rate so we can calculate that? Well, we would take the deaths in the age-specific strata for here are the uh, zero to five percent poverty census tracts, and here are the twenty to one hundred percent poverty census tracts. We have our deaths in each of the age strata. We have the population or person time from those census tracts, and then we use that U.S. year two thousand standard million to create weights to reweight these weights, uh, these uh, premature mortality rates into the amount that they contribute to the overall age standardized rate. So we're just reweighting each of the uh, age strata to get a reweighted age standardized estimate. And now we can actually compare these numbers. So this is something like a 2.15 times rate ratio between the highest poverty census tracts and the lowest poverty census tracts in terms of premature mortality. So there's a 2.15 times higher premature mortality rate in those highest poverty census tracts.
Okay, so that was what is referred to as the aggregate method, where we basically bunch up, we count up all the deaths and all the person time in the census tracts across whatever area-based social metrics that we want to analyze disparities across. But this gets uh, this method is really uh, not suited to trying to understand the effects of multiple area-based social metrics. The more area-based social metrics we tried to cross stratify by, this method would get really hairy really quickly. And so another method is to use regression. And in epidemiology, we tend to use count-based regression models like Poisson models, uh, quasi-Poisson or negative binomial models, which I'm not gonna talk about today. But we use these count-based models because in health outcomes, we typically have discrete events like cases or deaths. And it's important that our model accurately represent that. These uh, models typically model the log expected rate of events, uh, given the amount of person time uh, that could have given rise to the observed count. And we get coefficient estimates from these models that are interpretable as log incidence ratio, rate ratios. So I want to show an example just really quickly. Uh, this is the syntax that you would use to create a Poisson model. Um, so we use a generalized linear model. We have our numerator, the number of outcomes that we have, in this case, premature mortality deaths. Uh, and then we could have something like the poverty uh, area-based social metric. We have age categories for each of them. So this is a stratified analysis where we have counts for each different age group, and we have to add the person time in the denominator uh, to make sure that we're modeling these counts as a result of the person time. And again, we can get something similar. We get these incidence rate ratios after adjusting for age. Uh, here, these are the log incidence rate ratios, which if you exponentiate them, you can see, again, we have that 2.18 times rate ratio in the 20 to 100 percent versus the reference category. It's important that when we're doing these kinds of models that you set the reference category and um, that the rate ratios then are referent to that. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Tobler's first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So this is something our models can take into account. Uh, our models, one of the things that is important is that there may be spillover effects in terms of disease. There may, may be shared resources. There may be uncaptured factors that are causing things in nearby regions to share similar outcomes or health rates. And so uh, in small area estimation, we typically do some kind of pooling or modeling of the effects of neighbors. And uh, this is one popular model, the Bessag York and Mollier model, uh, that includes a spatially unstructured and spatially structured component. And we basically say that there's some part of the expected count that should be informed by the average uh, rate of its neighbors. And so this is an, an improvement to our modeling technique that we can take on. I don't think uh, it's appropriate for me to really get into the weeds with this kind of thing, but I think it's a, a useful concept for you to have that taking into account that spatial correlation structure is something that could improve your modeling in this area. Next, I want to talk about some pragmatic things. So here I have when the rubber meets the road, but I think a more uh, eco-sensitive phrase might be when the solar hits the panel. So one of the things that can happen when we publish maps of health outcomes, especially health outcome rates, is that places may become, and places and the people who live there may become stigmatized. And so it's critical that we include description maps um, and information about the resources and distribution of privilege that are available in these geographies so that we're not just saying, here's the places that are worst off versus best off and leaving it up to the reader to interpret what the causes might be because they might not arrive at the same conclusions that we do, but instead to explain what the unequal distribution of privilege, power, wealth, and resources are that might be leading to that. So unfortunately, if we just put out maps that show certain areas in red without explaining what the causal mechanisms might be, even if we just have to hypothesize what they might be, those places could be labeled as diseased, 
contaminated, and they could reinforce existing stigma that would lead to counterproductive targeted interventions such as heightened policing, heightened surveillance, attempts to control or contain residents, reclamation or de demolition of physical structures, social neglect, and abandonment. I want to talk a little bit more about data visualization, and I want to talk now about use of color. In this case, this is an example from a guidebook showing some uh, poor examples of use of color. And in this situation, the legend is reinforcing the idea that white is the reference or the default category, and that somehow people of color should be treated as a homogenous group or that they are somehow variations from the referent group. And that's completely inappropriate. And moreover, we have the groups labeled international and unknown being otherized here. Another important aspect of color use in maps is that we should be colorblind friendly. Of uh, Colorblindness is most well understood, like a lot of scientific uh, biological mechanisms in uh, people of European uh, ancestry, but you know, within that limited body of evidence, it's understood that roughly 8% of men who are of European ancestry experience some form of colorblindness. So it's a large proportion of researchers and our intended audience who may be excluded if we don't use colorblind friendly colors. There are a lot of resources to make sure that your uh, visualizations are colorblind friendly. One popular one for cartography is the Color Brewer uh, package uh, and website. Uh, there's the R Color Brewer package to use these in R. There's also websites where you can upload any data visualization you create and simulate what it looks like uh, under different kinds of colorblindness. And you can even do that in R. There's the uh, colorblind R package, which allows you to simulate these things. I don't have a slide on it, but I would like to highlight that uh, there's other kinds of iconography that's important. Like, for example, if you Google image search something like nurse icon, you will come up with a bunch of images that are female coded. And similarly, if you search Google images for something like the icon of a leader, you will come up with a bunch of icons that are male coded. It's important to not reinforce these kinds of discriminatory practices in our iconography, in our data visualizations. Okay, let's talk a little bit about outcomes. So I wanna talk about our online training manual, which is available free and completely online uh, open access at this URL, phdgp.github.io slash phdgp2.0. And um, let's see if I can click on it. Let's see. Maybe? Uh-oh. I might be thinking about it. I might be thinking about it. Oh, hey. Here we go. Um, so I just wanted to describe for you a little bit about what's in it. There is a preface and background and history of the analytic methods that we described. There's the R author bios. There's a guide for getting started and set up in R and R studio. There's some sections on how to get your data, including health outcomes and area-based social metrics. There's a section on how to visualize your data how to analyze your data, and we present five case studies, including premature mortality in Massachusetts, breast cancer mortality in Massachusetts, COVID-19 mortality in Cook County, where Chicago is located, case studies on temporal trends in the American Community Survey, and comparing county analyses of inequities in health insurance using the American Community Survey versus CDC places. Let's see if I can get back to my slides now. Um, that's a good question. Hopefully. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. So one of the things that we as teachers learned in our sessions was the importance of developing tracks for learning. So the people that we recruited to come to our training were from really diverse backgrounds. Some were statisticians, some were biostatisticians, but of course others were health department uh, staff, you know, people that maybe didn't have a lot of training in more advanced statistics, especially the things like small area estimation, like I was talking about before. And so we really emphasized 
three different tracks for learning in our project. We emphasized one being the data wrangling and coding, one being the interpretation, and one being the communication. And we emphasized that people should pick between these where they could get their best bang for their buck. So for example, public health department leadership might not be going back and doing the coding to actually implement these things, but instead might be thinking about what are the resources I need to uh, be able to provide my staff the facilities to do this kind of work? What kind of work do I want to see them do in the future? Likewise, we emphasize um, how to communicate these results. We summarized a lot of our work in these uh, summary posters. So we have one for creating area-based social metrics. Um, so again, highlighting things like to whom do they apply? Who is made visible? Who's made invisible? And um, of course, the data wrangling is like I showed you how to get the data from Tidy Census and to map it. And in terms of communication, I had talked about some of those data visualization components that are so critical in terms of colorblind friendliness, how to make sure that our visualizations aren't out there devoid of context and perpetuating stigma. And then moving on, we have a summary poster for summarizing health inequities. So we talk about uh, in terms of the actual data wrangling and coding, how to use the aggregation method, how to use the non-spatial regression methods that I talked about. Um, I introduced earlier the index of concentration at the extremes for racialized economic segregation, which helps us to make visible structural racism and thereby to do analyses that help us to understand health disparities according to structural racism. And um, of course, we talk to stakeholders about how to communicate health inequities by those area-based social metrics. So that's including things like those rate ratios that I described. And finally, we have multi-level and spatial models, which I described one of the Besag, York, and Mollier model. And um, of course, the data wrangling and coding is a little bit more intensive there. But again, we described how to map, how to estimate and map small area estimates. Um, for interpretation, we talk about what it means to control for additional area-based social metrics. How do we interpret the regression coefficients before and after controlling for those measures? And then um, in terms of uh, communication, we talk about specifically focusing on the question, how do we use these spatial an analyses and maps to catalyze action by whom in order to combat health inequities? Uh, one of the things I'm very pleased with is that the recordings from our lectures are online, so I'll put up the website in a moment, but you can go and find the full recordings from our lectures all online. So the full version of the content that I'm presenting here is available online, uh, should you be interested. And I think really I'm uh, trying to sell you on a research framework here uh, that incorporates health surveillance data, population denominator data, like the data from the census, and area-based social metric, like the social vulnerability index, poverty indices, measures of structural racism, et cetera. From those, we can create a merged analytic data set that contains all of those. We also get our geographic shape file, and we come up with some exploratory maps along the way to see what the patterns in those measures are. And then, of course, there's the three different approaches that I described. So there's the aggregate method where we do direct age standardization. And then there's the non-spatial regression methods and the spatial analyses or hierarchical regression models where we use regression adjustment for age. And uh, these allow us to produce small area estimates of health outcomes and regression estimates of inequities. Finally, I'd just like to conclude with this slide from Nancy Krieger that she often ends with. As you can see, social justice and public health are two pillars of eco-social theory, which I introduced earlier. The point of analyzing how injustices such as structural racism and others harm health is not to prove that they are wrong since they are definitionally unjust, but rather to do correct science and to generate publicly testable and tested actionable knowledge about who is bearing the burden of exposure to disease, illness, and death. The point is not to do so-called politically correct science, but rather to do correct science that, is, that rigorously addresses the causal mechanisms, complex social pathways, and spatiotemporal realities of how health inequities are perpetuated and conversely how they can be ended. 
We hope that you will take advantage of the resources we have collated for you, and that you will continue asking the hard questions of who must do what in collaboration with whom and in order to advance health justice, given the new knowledge that can be generated using the methods presented here and otherwise. I hope you'll keep connected with us and stay in touch. There are more resources on our Harvard School of Public Health website for the geocoding project. The training manual is online at the URL I mentioned earlier, and I'm quite available online. You are free to reach out to me via email, uh, follow me on GitHub or reach out on GitHub. I'm also on Mastodon on the Fetty Science instance, and I share my photography on Unsplash. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have now.